Welcome to Money Conversations with KJ. KJ is a lifelong entrepreneur who's made a lot of money, lost a lot of money, and found his way back again. If you're looking for a sterile how-to, you're in the wrong place. KJ and his guests will walk you through real-life situations told by the people who live them, and they are as messy as they are inspiring. Each episode will offer lessons learned, advice on how to replicate successes and avoid pitfalls, and a new perspective to power your financial literacy. Far from a one-size-fits-all, this podcast can help you build a roadmap to your personal promised land. Milk and honey for some, whiskey and steak for others, and remind you that you're not alone on this journey awesome welcome welcome everybody this is podcast number one we all have to start somewhere right and so today i have a a really good friend of mine coming out here to talk to us and share his story um financials what did he do how did he get where he is so mr banks here we've been friends for a few years now and um he retired at 55, so I thought that'd be a really good story to start with because only 6% of the population will retire at the age of 55, which is really awesome. And I think the journey that he went through is a pretty cool story and that um, we can all learn something from it. He just did some really not unique things, but just things that he learned along the way that got them to be able to retire at 55. So, Mr. Banks, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it. Yeah. So, as I mentioned, you retired at 55. Let's talk to the people about where did you work? Well, for 36 years, I worked at United Parcel Service, uh, UPS, uh, the Brown Delivery Company, and it afforded me the opportunity to do some of the things that I wanted to do and also have me a opportunity to have a fun working career is what I want to call it, a working career. Yeah, I think you had mentioned to me before, I mean, you literally went to work for those guys almost right out of high school, right? Literally. I mean, I started work with them in 1979, believe it or not. And uh, I started as a package handler, a package handler out there at uh, Gardena, California. And I did that for a number of years and an opportunity presented itself for me to join the management team as a part-timer. I did that for a few years and... uh, uh, the opportunity then presented itself for me to drive a package car for UPS. Believe it or not, Kevin, I was behind the wheel delivering packages. Wow. So that was a fun time. And I did that for approximately two years. And uh, they pulled my coattail and said, Aaron, we have some opportunities on our management team. Would you be interested in that? And of course, you know, I had to think about it for a few seconds. And the answer was obviously yes. And that started my management career. And really, my UPS career started with my management training, uh, my management opportunities, and from that point, I just took advantage of everything that came my way. So, I mean, that's really cool, but let me ask you real quick. So, as I'm thinking about, you just described, you know, where you started and you kept getting up those opportunities, and I would imagine you were there a long time. Um, the average time that someone stays at a company like that is probably not real long, but you recognize that you kept getting opportunities for an advancement. At what point in time in your career there, because you did your whole career there, did you figure, you know what, I'm going to stick this one out? I, this is a great company. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I would say probably once I did my basic management training and then you realize some of the benefits and the perks that come if you stay on board and, and hang your hat on the UPS brand, uh, that they'll do the same for you. So it became a, I don't want to say quid pro quo, but it became an opportunity that if you gave your time and effort to the company, they would make it worth your while. Let me give you a perfect example of that. One of the requirements for full-time management is that you have to be willing to relocate. They can come to you at a moment's notice and say, Aaron, you're doing a great job. We need your talents and skills in another city, another town, another state. And uh, then, of course, you know they'll pay the cost. They'll buy your house or uh, relocate you, find a job for your wife, and find schools for your kids, and they'll move you into your new town with your new job responsibilities. Now, with that said, there's also opportunities for you to become upwardly mobile. So if the promotion's involved with that, that makes it even better. Uh, If we were to go back in time and look back at some decisions that I made, I would say probably my first year of management was when I realized I might just want to stick around and ride this horse all the way to the finish. Well, how long were you there until you got that opportunity? How many years? (laughs) 
I started in 79. That opportunity presented itself for me in 86. So about seven years. Okay. So, you know, that that's that's a little more and above average of someone that sticks around their first job out of high school. Would you agree? I agree with that. I In high school, obviously, our maturity level is completely different than seven years after uh, my employment. So I, I, I have to say I was ripe for the right time. Yeah. And, and again, and the whole reason we're just kind of breaking down your background here is because, you know, this this program is designed to give people uh, an idea of how they're going to possibly retire at 55 and some of the things that you've done. And we'll keep talking about that. But I just want people to understand that, one, you obviously built a great work ethic right out of high school and you started to recognize opportunities over there at that great company um, that, hey, you know, I don't need to go look anywhere else. And man, what I need all could be right here. Now, that doesn't happen for everybody, obviously. Um, but talk to me about, so you got your management, you're cruising through, you're in your late 20s. When did you probably make the final decision of, you know what, I'm going to retire from this company? When do you think that happened? Yeah, that, that's a great, great question. I, I, I think back now, and some of the things that crossed my mind is what maturity I had to evolve to. So you remember at 19, just starting with UPS, I had girlfriends. Uh, by the time I was in management and um, ready to pursue a career, now I have a wife. So my responsibilities have changed. Then by the time I had made my mind up that uh, this was the place I was going to hang my hat, I was going to ride this horse to the finish, now I have a wife and a son. So from a maturity level, for anyone who's listening, I, I can tell you this. You learn the value of a good job, a good paying job, is when your responsibilities drastically change. When you have yourself, that's all you're responsible for. When you have yourself and a wife, that changes again. Now you throw in a bundle of joy. My son was born in 1984. And your responsibility and your maturity and your vision about finances and money drastically change. So I would say that period of time, my seventh, eighth year with the company, was really a growing time for me. And I just kind of stuck my, put my foot in the ground and said, okay, this is the way I'm going to go. It's going to get all my effort, going to get all my attention. And then the benefit of working for a company like UPS, they gave me the training that I needed so that I could get a vision, a vision about what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I think that's probably the starting point. Awesome. I mean, I'm going to segue right into that. One of the things I talk about, and you've been to my uh, financial literacy workshops, and the first thing I always talk about is the mindset, right? We all have to really develop the right mindset around your time and money, right? And so you being with that company, it sounds like, yeah, you, you went from, you know, just a, a late teenager, young man, and then got yourself a, a decent career job there and then, and then fell in love, started having babies, right? And your mindset started shifting, sounds to me, in your late 20s, early 30s and thinking about okay, this is where I'm going to post up and finish. Talk to me about, we all know that big companies like that are going to give you the 401ks and whatnot. What, at what point did you start thinking, um, you know what, I may need, may need or want more money than the 401k that they're giving me and decide into investing into other things? How did that come about? Yes, um, I, I would say the Benefit package that UPS offered uh, was a program called the Thrift Plan. And the Thrift Plan was a match. You put in a certain percentage and UPS would match it. And that money was not allowed to be touched as long as you were in your working days. It was a, a, a kind of a, a forced retirement. Based on your um, income, you're based on your living style, you were forced to put in maybe 1%. Some people put in a half a percent because they just didn't have the extra money. Uh, I, I tried to put in at least, uh, the minimum I put in the thrift plan was 7%. And I wanted to put in 10, but I, I just, at that time when I first joined the thrift plan, I just didn't have the extra money. And, I, and let me rephrase that. I didn't think I had the extra money. 
Ah, see, that's a mindset thing, right? Because everything's 2020 hindsight. Now that you're, you know, you've been retired now like seven years and you look back, you're like, yeah, you know what? I could have maybe had one less dinner a week and I could have, you know, I could have stretched that to the 10%. And then when you're retired, you know, if you start doing math now, you're like, oh, man, that would, I, I'd have now maybe an extra thousand dollars a month than what they're giving me or something. Right. So, again, mindset, thinking and acting with your time and money is what I like really like to talk with people about their financial education, and their financial literacy of learning how to play the game. Right. You and I talk about it all the time. You got to learn how to play this game. But like I always say, if you don't know the rules of the game, any game, you ain't going to win. Right. And so that's what financial literacy is, is learning the rules of the game so we can win financially. So you awesome because, you know, you didn't go the route of college like a lot of people do. Basically, your college was UPS, but they taught you management skills, skill sets that people go spend a lot of time, money and effort learning that this company did for you, which is awesome. Um, back to talking about investing that other than that because that was with work that was just coming right out of your check and you were doing xyz and then and then came along outside investing on your part share with the audience what you did outside of work when you're like i gotta put more money to work well it probably started probably say the early 90s um i had an opportunity i worked in a department for ups called business development and in business development, we were forced to put together a budget. And the bu the word budget was the farthest thing from my mind as a young UPS employee. What the <laughs> heck is a budget? Are you kidding me? Right. So by putting together a budget and working on a business plan, because that was the other part of it. Once you had the budget put in place, you had to develop a business plan with action steps. And uh, there was something called SMART, uh, Specific, Measurable, Action-Oriented, Realistic, and Time-Bound. I still remember that, Dan. Ah. So anyway, uh, that acronym was used to help us build our business plan uh, based on the budget that you had money allotted for your department. So because business development is a sales function, we go out, we develop customers, we grow the business, and we try to meet our business plan with financial or revenue goals, in this particular case, revenue goals. What I found out was those same tools, those same instruments that I needed to put, take my budget through the business plan and make it successful, I could apply to my regular life. Ah. I, you mean to tell me that I can have a budget at home? I have spreadsheets? Use Microsoft Excel and build something and have my expenses versus my revenues and what profits I could make and... And then someone told me something about, and, and actually it was a customer, I was at a customer's location, and they asked me, he said, so what investments are you involved with? And I thought to myself, do I lie and say I'm involved with investments? Or do I tell the truth? <laughs> and, and I was in a good mood, so I decided to tell the truth. The point was I had no investments. I had nothing that I was planning. And through the conversation of myself with this customer, I learned something about index funds and about paying yourself first. Uh -huh. And he talked to me about something called the Pareto Theory, which now I guess is known as the rule of 72. And, I, you know, I looked at my son, at this point now I have two children, bouncing baby girl and my son. And now I'm starting to look and think to myself, well, you know, I know that I'm going to be for the long haul, but I'm still you know, what is that, my, probably in my mid-30s, mid to late 30s. And at that point I began to realize, you know, I'm going to have to pay myself first. What a novel idea. <laughs> and the, fun, the, the sad thing about that is I didn't come up with it. It came as a result of being involved with a department and a function that had to deal with budgets and finance and planning for revenue goals and growth. And because of that, I started applying that to my life. And so obviously doing just a little bit of research, you start reeling about owning stocks and buying, um, um, investing in yourself by getting additional education and and as I say, uh, if you can sit down with yourself and have a conversation, and when you start answering your own questions, you know that you're on the right path, Kevin. Right, right. So that's awesome. That's really awesome, you know, because you've been to my, like I said, my workshops, and that's what we teach, right? I mean, I, I teach that to my kids. Listen, you get that check. Who gets paid first? Who's your first bill you're going to pay? And nine times out of 10, I've asked this question to hundreds of people, and they all think, oh, I got to pay my rent for my mortgage first, right? That's first on the list. I got to live somewhere. I said, wrong. You got to pay yourself first. 
right? Nobody more important than you. And so you learn that at an early age. It's funny because you learn that almost accidentally, right? You're just doing your job as directed and how they trained you and how you thought, well, heck, I can just do, I, I need to do this at home, the same exact thing that I learned. So that's an awesome, awesome lesson because picture it, imagine, had you not gone down the path of management and you were another direction and you didn't learn that, what a difference in your life that would have made, right? That you never learned about index fonts until you're 50 years old or something, right? And so I hope this is a, a great, nice, what I like to call aha moment, golden nugget for the audience out there. Like, folks, you can get out there. These index funds today, you can open an index fund for 100 bucks and start. And the sooner you start, the better. Amen. Because you had mentioned the rule of 72, which is compound interest. is one of the lessons I teach. Once you truly understand compound interest, how it works, right, um, you'll be better for it. Einstein says, he who knows it earns it. He who doesn't pays it. Right. So it's vitally important. And I'll teach that lesson to you guys later. Um, so here you are. You're cruising through. Sounds to me like you're probably about midway through your career, 15, 18 years in. You got your family going. You got your 401k going. Now you started with your index funds and you probably figured, hey, you know what? I can see the finish line. At what point did you know that 50, age 55 was going to be your time to retire? When did you actually figure that out? And, I, and again, another excellent question, because as time went on in my UPS career, there was a benefit that was dangled out there that in my early years of my management uh, journey, uh, it didn't mean much to me. But as I got older, especially in my early 40s, I began to realize that, you know, there's something called medical, good health, paying for uh, the opportunity to go see a doctor that doesn't break the bank, so to speak. And UPS offered, as part of the manager program, if you reach age 55 and you have at least 25 years of service, you will receive as the kind of the golden nugget, the pot at the end of the rainbow, you receive a pension equivalent to 65% probably of your gross pay and medical, medical for life. And that medical for life was enough for me in my early 40s to say, you know, that's worth striving for. If I can make it to the finish line, if I can get to that goal line and cross that goal line, the nugget waiting for me in free medical was enough for me to push and push. And I just kept pushing. Nice. And again, I guess and we, and we all know how important it is because medical expenses, medical expenses are ridiculous. Um so here we are. You said, you know, you end up retiring at 55. And talk to me about during those years. And again, I'm, I want to really give some good value out there to the folks that are out there listening. And, and maybe maybe they're with a company, you know, parallel to a UPS or what have you. And they're on the fence. Should I stick it out? Not stick it out. I don't know if I'm making enough or, you know, or stick it out. Um, what kind of advice would you give somebody out there with that type of company? and how to be able to retire, you know, 55 or even 60, let's just say. Well, the first advice I'd give is um, there were many times, uh, because, you know, one of the advantages I had with a company like UPS is they have assistance programs. The thrift plan I mentioned earlier, another plan was probably in, I want to say late 90s, the company went public. And as a result of the company going public, I had an opportunity to buy or purchase UPS stock at a discount. And every free penny I had, I was buying UPS stock. And the reason I was buying that is because UPS paid a quarterly dividend. So not only was I buying stock at a discount in a very progressive company, they had a quarterly dividend it was paying out, and I would just reinvest the dividend back into that fund account. But I also began to realize as I got closer to the end and um, trying to make a decision about what exactly I wanted to stay focused on, I had to give up some things. You know, I, I would drive a 10-year-old car. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't buy a new suit unless my other suit really just went out on me. And, and I became, uh, I don't want to say cheap. My brother would call me cheap. But I was frugal. I was, uh, uh, my, and my wife was on the same page with me. And we just didn't spend over our means. And that allowed me to put more in money into the thrift plan, and then later when the thrift plan converted to a 401k into the 401k, 
the UPS stock program, and I put the money that I knew I was going to get returned after age 55. And that process worked for me. So, okay, so you live within your means. You were wise with your money, so you weren't out there just freelancing it, just, you know, living high on the hog, so to speak, where you probably could have been one of the, a lot of these, you know, a lot of folks out there like to buy their new cars every three, four years, right? And if you can afford it, fantastic. If you can, because you're building, you're building something. You knew that the light at the end of the tunnel. Talk talk to me in, in the mindset. This I want to switch them back to the mindset where some of the folks out there might be thinking like, well, maybe 55 is too early to retire. Maybe, you know, I need to work longer because I want more things out of life. And I know you personally, and I know that you live a very comfortable uh, retired lifestyle. And did you do all of those things knowing that at 55, I know I'm still going to earn money. I'm just not trading time for it. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. And I can tell you this, Kevin, probably in my late 40s, there's something about, at least for me, reaching the age of 50, I, I just remember as a child looking at my father, and when he turned 50, I, I thought, my father is old at 50. It just, in my mind, that meant something to me. I, I, so as I approached 50, I kept thinking, man, Aaron, you're going to be 50 years old. What, what do you have to say for yourself? And I remember saying to myself, you know, I, you know I, I've got plenty to say. I've got plenty to say. I'm going to make it to 55 and I want my father to see me make it to 55 and I can retire and show him that he did a good job guiding me, well, the little that he did guide me to the best of his ability, uh, guiding me and that, you know, you can have your offspring do better than you. And I kept thinking to myself, you know, my father struggled for all those years working for Hughes Aircraft back in those days. And I just remember watching him struggle with um, the four kids that he had. And I kept thinking to myself, you know, when I get to be 50, I want to be able to have a car paid for. I had two cars paid for that when I got to 50. And I want to be able to, I, I, on retiring, and retiring early enough where I can still enjoy my kids and grandkids and have fun. At that time, I'm, I was an avid golfer. I kept thinking, you imagine getting up in the morning and playing golf because I want to. You know, I, I could finish the round, have lunch, and if I wanted to play another round of golf, I could. Little FYI, folks, that's what he did today. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I was motivated by some of the, the, the perks that come with being retired, seeing retired people, retired UPSers even, and uh, seeing the lifestyle and the freedom that comes and the joy. And, uh, and you know, Kevin, it was just very appealing to me. That's awesome. I, and I think so. I, I hear your story and I hear that story. I've heard that story a lot as far as, you know, we always want to strive to do better than whatever our parents did. You know, we've all seen our parents work hard and whatnot. Um, but we know in today's world, right, man, there's a lot of single moms out there. So there's a lot of kids, men, young boys, uh, young men that are growing up and they don't they don't have that father figure. Right. So I'm hoping that the, this conversation that they can kind of live vicariously through you, right? Like, I don't need to prove anything to my father. Maybe I just need to prove it to myself, right? And have those goals and reach those goals, right? So what was your biggest goal when you got, you were creeping up, you're like, man, I got two more years, I'm 55, I'm done. What what, what were your goals? Did, what did you perceive retirement to be for you? Well, first thing I had to focus on was, was, was health. Um, I kept thinking to myself, you know, at 55, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to have a long, healthy life. So one of the things I, I kind of cracked down on was I started saying to myself, you know, I'm going to make exercise part of my daily routine. And I just pursued it, it, whatever the smallest level. Could it be stretching? Could it be walking? Could it be um, weightlifting or whatever the scenario might have been? Uh, I just wanted to stay active. That was one. Uh, the other thing was once you get to a point and you look at your children, at that point, my children are now, you know, teenagers. And I start thinking, you know, they're, they're, they're watching their dad. They're actually looking at me and monitoring how I'm handling things. And I kept thinking to myself, how can I continue to be a good example to them? You know, and without telling them everything, just showing them. And I spent just a great deal of time continuing to do things in front of them, 
with them and showing them that there's another way to kind of gather the acorn, so to speak, Kevin. Gather those acorns. Okay, you, you, you got my mind shift in here because I'm thinking now as I'm as I'm I'm trying to be the listener out there listening to you and and what the type of advice that you would give a young 24, 28, 30 year old young man who's either one trying to still figure it out, two maybe he is married or with a kid at that age. What what advice would you give that young man with money and how he should think and act with it? to be able to reach some sort of a financial independence. Mm, you know, it's funny you said that because once I attended your financial um, educational seminar, I, I saw that there's a way that if I could have gotten that same education that I, I got sitting in on your seminar, uh, that would have made a big difference for me. And I would love my son and my daughter uh, to take the same class. Now that you're doing the podcast, I would say... Uh, there's no question in my mind, understanding the power of investing, uh, the rule of 72, that compound interest is the way to go. Paying yourself first. Um, understanding that paying yourself sometimes comes with a little bit of financial discomfort. Uh, it, it might come with a, you know, a feeling of, um, I'm not sure if I'm doing the right thing. You are. Pay yourself first. There's no question about it. I would also add that now that you're doing interviews like this podcast, if people would just take the time, listen, take a few notes, I can tell you right now, the simple concepts of investing in index funds early, um, opening up a savings account, if that's all you can do, but continue to pay yourself, continue to build in yourself, trust in yourself, and invest in yourself, education, taking extra classes, whatever it takes, that'll pay off in the long run. Well said, well said. You know, some of the things that I teach in that uh, in that workshop that I do as far as investing is I'm, I'm a huge believer in the Roth IRA. And I know that you had index funds. I know you had a regular IRA. And, and you know, I had talked about the Roth IRA because of the benefit of the Roth IRA. Now that you, you're at the age you're at, a little over 60, that – Boy, none of us like to pay all that tax money to the government, do we? And so investing with that Roth IRA teaches you, I teach in the class, how you can earn tax-free money. How sweet would tax-free money be to you at this age? Uh, tax-free money is music to my ears. <laughs> 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 you know, it, it, for me, when I was working and during my working years, uh, the Roth IRA, IRA was not in not available. It wasn't. A, it was not a financial vehicle. It came along after uh, my um, thrift plan. It came along after my four hundred one k investments. But once I retired, and actually talking to you, I knew about the Roth IRA. I had an individual retirement account that I owned through a life insurance policy, and that was fine. But after talk, really, I mean, this is one of the first years you and I were friends. Is that you told me about the. Roth IRA and did a little research on me. I was a little hesitant with it because I just, you know, I just don't like tying money up in institutions uh, that have names. Okay. <laughs> Seems kind of stupid, but hey, believe it or not, Kevin, the, the, the name Roth, I was like, no, is that, is that legitimate? You know, let me check my tax tables. Anyway, after a little research, I realized that a Roth IRA was legitimate. It's a great source for investing after tax money so the money can grow and it can, if you hold the money in there for a minimum of five years, that, that growth, that growth becomes tax free money. That's what you're really looking at. Right. So, yeah, no, no. Excellent. Then again, that, that uh, using that as a tool to your advantage over time. Um, and you get to retirement age, whether it's 55, 65, 75, whatever the age is, like you said, as long as you're minimally invested five years in that thing it is a great tool. Um, just because I know other people that have a lot of money in, you know, like 401ks and stuff. And I said, well, you haven't paid tax on that money yet. Yeah. So don't get excited. There's a million dollars in that 401k, <laughs> son. You know, you're in a high tax bracket right now. So uh, relax and keep working. Um that's awesome. So listen, I, I hope that a lot of folks, I think, got a good takeaway from you. Number one, work work habit and stick it out. No matter what we do, that sun's going to come up every day. And we're all got to go out there and do what we got to do. Whether you end up with one job in your whole career like Mr. Banks did, 
uh, which is great. Or if you had 20, however you need to get to the finish line, we've got to get to the finish line because everybody does have a finish line. It's just, what is it that out there for you? Right. Um, what can we share with the audience on your end as a retiree? Are there any fears that you have financially? Fears. Um, I would say the only fear that I would have financially is probably just the unknown. And I shouldn't even say it's a fear. It's more of a, a hindrance because there are all, just like the Roth IRA as a perfect example, there are instruments and tools available for people. If you don't know, you have to ask. And sometimes just being involved with the investment groups, um, investment teams, or talking it, It comes back to the old theory about you are who you're surrounded around. If you're surrounded about people who have the like-mindedness that you have, you're on your way to a good path. If that like-mindedness is about growing and maintaining and avoiding taxes on the income that you do make. So without being specific from a fear standpoint about something that kind of scared me off, it's the unknown. It's educating yourself and staying in tune and minding the bird's nest because those eggs, as Kevin would always say, uh, are like little soldiers that you send out to grow and to multiply. Uh, that's what you want to do. You want to have your investment money go out and work for you. So I agree. I agree. That's Warren Buffett's big saying, right? Until you learn how to make money while you sleep, you will work until you die. Right. So, yes, take those dollars there. To me, my dollars are soldiers and I got to send them out there and they're recruiting more soldiers. And don't come back until you got multiplied by 10. Don't come back so I can send you boys back out there again. I, you know, I, I love saying that that saying there. It's fun because you can just uh, picture. I just I just picture an animated dollar bill running out there looking for more. Right. Hey, let me turn that one dollar bill into a ten dollar bill. I mean, come on back to the house. I can send you out to turn you into a 20. Right. No. Well said. Well said. Awesome. Hey, listen, I appreciate you coming out today, sharing your your experiences through your life. I'm sure there's some people out there that uh, had some aha moments, maybe some uh, some some really good um, nuggets and whatnot. Um, Listen, if you want to reach out to me, send me out an email. If you have any questions, you can reach me at um, Fintel at gmail.com that's f-i-n-n-t-e-l-l at gmail.com send me some questions send me a little whatever you want to send me i'd love to hear from you guys and uh again this is podcast number one podcast number two will be out in a week i'm going to try to get i'm going to get one out to you guys every single week i got a lot of stories for you i got a lot of great people with with some great experiences i think that uh, we can all learn from and then i'm going to just go ahead and and give you guys throw in some extra nuggets that you guys can learn so uh i hope you enjoyed the show and i'll see you guys on the next one mr banks thanks again for coming out all right you're more than welcome okay you guys take care Hey, everybody. Hope you enjoyed that episode. I really enjoyed making all these episodes for you. Remember, we're just having uh, conversations with people's journey with money and the things they did right with it, the things that did wrong with it, and uh, how how did they really come about getting their mindset with money. So uh, every episode is different. We all have a good takeaway from them. So do me a favor, hit the like button, smash the like button, and subscribe to my channel because every episode that I do is going to be different as all our journeys are different. So you guys take care and uh, we'll talk to you next week.